For those of you who missed the wonderful show at the Rijksmuseum of the Golden Age this last year, we thought we'd present uh, Mr. Philip Koch, the director of collections, talking a little about that marvelous show. There is a tradition, um, met with lot, uh, also from the classical times, that there was a golden age where everybody was happy, it was, times were successful, and there was an enormous flowering of the arts, there were no wars. That idea uh, comes from the classical times, and it is applied, I think, in the, in the 19th century to the 17th century in Holland. Um, and I think it is very appropriate, certainly at the moment that you look back at a better time where the art was flowering on an unbelievable way. And in the 19th century, I think the reconstructing the, uh, the quality of life uh, from, in comparison to the early it was very much an item, so at that time the idea of the Golden Age uh, existed, and I think it is very, it represents still how rich that period was. was. So for that reason we use it as a sort of common uh, nominator. Now, in that period of time, uh, so obviously the arts flourished. Why do you think that uh, more than a million paintings may have been uh, produced during that period. I think several millions. Uh, I think there was an enormous uh, competition uh, and a strongly growing market. There was space for paintings in the houses and um, people liked to have a variety of it. So the money was there, the artists were there and there was a, mar a growing market that uh, acquire things and in that period I think many artists tried and a number of them became very uh, great artists, a number of them stayed uh, very mediocre but I think making art for the market was a new phenomenon in art history on the scale it was done in Holland and I have the feeling at the end of the 70s centuries when the houses grow large really large collections of paintings um, started to be uh, put together um, there was enough uh, there was not a need for that mass production again so at that moment the number of artists slows down um, there is less competition but there is still a very stable continuity uh, there is not that much uh, new approaches but there is this large decorative uh, tradition that's strongly connected with friends and what in fact takes over uh, in the ruling classes the interest of the new buyer generation now there is a, a kind of continuity that might be considered schools of painting. I think of the at the turn of the century, maybe Utrecht had the most influence on. Uh, on. Did this go on throughout the 17th century? Um, I think there were a few strongly flowering uh, cities for artists in uh, Haarlem, uh, Utrecht, in a certain way, but um, and there was. Of course, immigration between them. Um, I think Haarlem was probably the only sitting city that has the tradition from the 16th century on. Utrecht was different in the way that it was a strong Catholic city, and the, it was a sort of old-fashioned uh, painting tradition that continued during the century. Um, I think it becomes at the end of the century uh, more 
diffuse and uh, I think many uh, artists immigrated at the time that the city was not doing very well to another city, moved into other countries. So there was uh, quite a lot of migration. But Utrecht, I think, is a bit an artistic community determined by um, the um, yeah, the old-fashioned tradition, the classicist was a bit available, the Caravages, the paintings got to Italy and came back. But I don't really believe in local schools. It is, uh, there was more movement between the cities. Now in the 17th century, of course, um, the country as we know it, the Netherlands, was an infant. Uh, was was in fact just being born in its own way. Does the type of painting, uh, the genre painting, the the development of landscape painting during this period, is it especially affected by the fact that this is a new republic trying to define itself outside of the traditional old aristocracy of Europe? I think so. There was um, anyhow a local mind on on from circles that going from very rich ones, the new growing uh, burgers in Amsterdam to the rather simple people that are buying paintings for a few kilders and decorated their houses with them. I think there was uh, most of the art in the past was commissioned and mostly by the upper circles. Um, the painting in the 17th century become owned by a much broader society. So it stimulated, I think, artists to do what he liked, to make attractive paintings for a large public, to represent daily life um, on a scale that was never done before. So the landscape is really the surroundings. Uh, so Haarlem played I think quite an important role in that since the uh, outskirts of Haarlem were represented so much uh, and so directly in these paintings that the people that lived there probably bought them to recognize their own surroundings. I think still lives were made uh, to give pleasure, I think. Um, so there was a, a very broad demand for paintings that fulfilled their, their um, a role in the household uh, that people liked and were not less interested in the actual meaning. Um, the, uh, there was less interest, I think, for historical paintings. There was, was more interest for subjects that were daily life connected. And that had certainly to do with the circles that bought them. Now we know that Rembrandt painted a lot of biblical scenes in one sense or another, but this was a, a republic that was freed from the fetters of Catholic uh, adoration of the saints and one thing after another. Did this sort of secularization of society have an impact on the painting of the 17th century? The secularization as such, I think there were no in general no great art altar pieces made anymore, but I think in the other fields, the religion was became more privatized. It, there were small uh, Haydn churches. There were the local. I think there were very many Catholics, in fact, in uh, Amsterdam that still have their private devotion, and things were made for that too. But um, the general trend in society was anyhow not to build. Uh, monumental um, monuments for um, the religious art and so uh, there were no artists that really could live on that. Um, so I think there is a change in the, um, in the people that ordered paintings quite considerably and there were so many levels so the, the I think it is also the period of the outburst of printmaking. There was an enormous amount of visual material uh, produced in that time, and that was that was in the whole of Europe and was um, exported to the whole of Europe. 
in both directions. So it was an image culture. I think that's probably one of the things that is very typical for this time. Uh, there were no photographs, there was no film. So you, the news was spread by images. And that is, uh, I think, rather particular at that special period. So the colonization has also to do with, I think, uh, the, the spread of information, the spread of images, the interest in, uh, in all new facts of the world. And I have the feeling there was an enormous exploiting mind at that time. Uh, people want to know about the rest of the world, want to have information, and images, paintings were used for that. Now, within the exhibition, you've organized it in a certain manner to convey certain ideas about it. Could you describe the genesis of, of your organization here? Uh, yeah, that is, uh, the genesis was very much that we like to present uh, an image of 17th century art, how it grows out of the collection of the Rijksmuseum, so the most splendid works of art from the Rijksmuseum with the Nightwatch in the middle were still the basis on which we made the exhibition and then we we thought after missing elements in elements that makes a stronger combination that's uh, a convincing and that tells both works of art or combination about themselves more so surprises in that way then i think we uh, you could make a a collection of 200 masterpieces that had n nothing to do with each other, which you have to see as individuals. And that idea we still like to maintain. On the other hand, we hope that each room tells a certain story. And when we made uh, the first selections and listed, we started very much to install the exhibition in rooms, in fact, and to see what combinations works, what was missing, what you could add to it, and what you could throw out of it. And that was a long process where the um, uh, when loans that we could get were, of course, determined, uh, since uh, there are a number of wishes that couldn't be fulfilled for all kinds of reasons, mostly since the conservation didn't allow uh, painting to be transported. So uh, we we concepted the exhibition very much in a series of 24 chapters of the book. Oftentimes, painters like Jan Steen are seen as humorists, but in fact they were had more of a message in their paintings. Uh, how did this genre of conveying message or moral certitudes develop in Holland? I think that's that's a continuous debate among art historians. Um, there is no doubt that uh, there was a strong moralistic tradition from uh, the 16th century on. So it's um, the there were images made the, uh, that really convey that idea. You have it in literature. You have all uh, the elements uh, in books. Uh, the question is, or does artists, well, of course, artists of their time, and were influenced by these ideas. I think the Calvinist religion as such was very strongly moralistic, but the Calvinists were not that much uh, interested in images, in fact. Um, so I have the feeling there is always, there could be a sometimes a very outspoken meaning that you could co conclude out of the painting a moralistic meaning in the sense um, that it is a sort of warning about uh, an ordinary life. Uh, that kind of warnings are everywhere. At the same time, I think the, um, the pleasure in which the story is represented shows that it is more than moralistic alone. It is also to enjoy um, and to um, to make a sort of joke uh, to the public. Um, I think the, it was an age that was very fond of jokes and um, getting getting uh, things in other perspectives. And I'm I'm not so sure that in all still lives uh, you could. Uh, 
find elements of vanity, but I don't think these paintings were made uh, to represent vanity in the first place. In fact, it were representations of uh, of still lives uh, that were made to uh, imitate the visual world so um, yeah, so close as possible. It, the trompe l'oeil, the idea that you really um, the people think that a flat surface could pre present a three-dimensional object, that was very much an idea of that time. So painting was made to create illusions. And I think when there was an ambition between these paintings and also in the buyers, was uh, it that it should be so close as possible. It should be trompe l'oeil. It should bring over the pleasure of structures of daily life. It should be surprising. And I think that's the idea that during the time overpowered by moralism and by the idea that always a hidden meaning, there could be hidden meanings, but I think it is very much part of the thinking of the period where you could also could explain it on different ways, give it different meanings. That's I think what was the surprising part of it, but it is less intellectual, I suppose. I think many of these artists were quite illiterate and certainly didn't read uh, Latin texts. Uh, so I think it's more the, the mood of the time than that you could discover very deep meanings in general. Now Rembrandt is the quintessential artist of the 17th century. He's been conveyed presented over and over again. How does this show uh, present Rembrandt? And are there some new revelations that we might look for uh, about Rembrandt, or can there be? Now, I think it is difficult to um, really cave new elements in the sense that uh, the paintings are known, um, you could present and combine them in another way. And I think the early work of Rembrandt is extremely well represented, the work of the 30s, with, I think, in that series, the Night Wars at the end, um, with the allegorical paintings, with the portraits. I'm, I must say, I, I think the combinations are a surprise to have a painting from Los Angeles uh, that hasn't been in Holland in three ages, uh, in three centuries. And um, the, the combination of the Adam Bogart portrait and the group portrait by Tulp hasn't, has never been shown and it combines very well with the Levens painting of that period. So I think that there are more the combinations that show element, new elements. With later elements, I, I think it's marvelous to have the U.S. bride next to Van Gelder, who was really the only pupil who continued to work in the late style of Rembrandt. And I think it is much more convincing how much these artists has to do with this other and have the same quality level than normally. Uh, you see. I think the combination with the Franz Hals late coup portrait and the syndics is really a revelation for me, since it shows so good there uh, how different they are and what qualities they have in common. So I think Rembrandt is represented uh, with a number of major uh, paintings um, that show him as an artist of his time at the uh, at the very top, uh, but he really fitted in the context of the time with last man, with Levens, with his later pupils, uh, with Franz Hals. Um, we didn't like to represent him as an isolated figure, but he certainly wasn't. Now, during the 17th century, there were a number of there had to be almost factory production to produce two million paintings, or as many Marvelous. as you say. Yeah. I mean, extraordinary. Was there a, a, a manner in which a young apprentice uh, would come to an, an artist? How, how did that guild system actually operate in the 17th century? On, I think on a rather different way. I think a, 
the training of the artist was mainly done in the artist's workshop where a young apprentice came in when he was 12 or 14 and his parents paid for his housing and training in fact and at a certain point uh, so he learned the trade from the beginning to the end in uh, printing uh, paints in uh, preparing canvases in uh, making studies um, after uh, classical, after pl plasters and classical sculpture. And at the end, I think, he produced paintings in the style of his master that were often, that could be uh, treated as works of his master. I think the, the idea was very much that one learns the style of the master and then develops his own personality. So, I think we have quite a lot of information, but in every city it was different. The big debates how strong the kilts are in control and quality. Um, it is really clear that in the uh, crafts and the decorative arts, the kilts were as powerful as in the Middle Ages. For uh, painting workshops, I think it is. Uh, it is very much dependent on the quality of the master who organized a big workshop, as Rembrandt did, uh, Ruben did in Antwerp. Bloemaert in Utrecht was an enormous workshop with, with his sons involved. But I think most of the artists have one or two apprentices uh, during their lifetime, and many of them worked very much individual and didn't be part of a larger group. It depends enormously, I think. All three of these are possible. Now, oftentimes we think of the 17th century as uh, a time of extreme wealth for Holland, uh, uniqueness in itself. With that wealth, which they mostly got from trading overseas and discovering new things, they brought back a lot of uh, odd, curious things, which we saw, of course, in Rembrandt's uh, Schatkammer. Yeah. Was this a theme in 17th century painting also? Uh, I think in both ways. A number of paintings were part of the curiosities that were collected. Uh, I think in a workshop as Rembrandt's, he used it as models uh, for his, his artworks. Uh, I think clothes from different periods were used in history of paintings um, to give an idea of how things there were. I think we have the paintings of a painting of uh, Franz Post in the exhibition that represents Brazil and is certainly part of such a curiosity a cabinet. So. That was one of a group of paintings that was given to the French, uh, uh, the French king, uh, Louis XIV, and what must have been part of um, an amazing collection of curiosities. So I think both parts are available, and um, and there the tradition of very uh, the ivory sculpture we had at the end of the exhibition is very much a Kunst und Wunderkammer object too and these the 17th century small paintings the, um, were very much part of um, became in the 18th century a collection of cabinet pieces that were treated as the uh, curious objects from all over the world, so it came very close to each other. It became, uh, it was um, frame, art was made partly to amaze and to impress, and curiosities were there too. Thank you very much for being with us today, it's been a delight.